Hello, everybody, and welcome to the several hundred people who have joined us for tonight's webinar, and also the viewers who are watching the recording, which will be out in due course. MHPM would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. I'm currently on Balangara country in the north of uh, Western Australia, and we pay respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So Steve Trumbull is my name. I'm a general practitioner by background, currently travelling, uh, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session thanks to the miracle of mod modern technology from El Questro Station in uh, the Kimberley. So there you go. Uh, I'm involved in medical education, and uh, one of the things I really enjoy is doing these webinars. So we're lucky tonight to have a wonderful panel. I'm not going to go through their bios in detail because they were circulated with the webinar. But the first person I would like to or like you to meet is Bill Buckley, who's from Victoria. He's an alcohol and uh, other drugs mental health educator with lived experience. So, Bill, as an educator in the AOD sector, what key messages do you provide for your students about the importance of language when engaging with clients? Well, Steve, I'd generally like to stress the importance uh that language does play and, and that uh, you can't underestimate the impact that um, language does have on someone's ongoing recovery. Great. So really important then to make sure that we're using appropriate terminology, which I know we'll come to in more detail with your <coughs> presentation. So looking forward to that. But Mary, so Dr. Mary Emilias is a psychiatrist based in um, where Queensland meets New South Wales on the coast there. In Corumba, an introductory question for you, Mary. From what Bill said, uh, the terms we do use to describe people are very important. Uh, how does this sit with the health system's need to label us with a diagnosis uh, before we can access services? Um, Steve, I think that that would probably be a topic of its own for another webinar. Um, but I think that there are definitely. I don't know. There's an art of balancing what the system needs, but remembering that we that we treat people, not disorders. And it can be really difficult when you feel as a clinician or a helper um, backed into a corner where you've got to give someone a label, um, which they might find stigmatising. But on the other hand, some people find diagnoses really helpful and sometimes they're very important. So in tonight's case, for example, alcohol use disorder kind of indicates the severity of the problem, which actually can be clinically very important. So I think the answer is it's complicated. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I've heard it said that labels are for jam jars, so I suspect that we'll come to that later on. As you say, it's a carefully balanced uh, decision about how much labelling to do in order to get access to services without stigmatising. Um, and speaking of stigmatising, though, uh, Hester Wilson, so from New South Wales, a general practitioner uh, with a very strong profile in uh, the, uh, assisting people with alcohol and other drug disorders, um, it does seem, Hester, that we can too easily stigmatise a person because of their behaviours. Is this a risk in general practice, especially with the advent of real-time prescription monitoring? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Look, real-time prescription monitoring, and it's called different things depending on your state you're in, whether it's SafeScript Victoria or SafeScript New South Wales or QScript or the other, the other ones around the country. Uh, it's been something that uh, we're very pleased has been introduced because it can support safer prescribing because we know that prescription medicines, particularly the psychoactive ones, um, can be risky and can cause harm. But the issue is how we have those conversations and how we make sure that we give really clear messages around wanting to assist someone to have best health outcomes, to, to limit harm and not to label and discriminate. Um, the risk being that if somebody is turned away from accessing prescription medicines, that if they do have a dependency, if they do have a prescription medicine use disorder, that they will end up having to access more risky drugs 
And we've certainly seen this in the states where people have been turned away and have therefore moved towards using heroin. Now, heroin is an opioid, just like other opioids, but it's injected, it has a quick onset, and so the risk of serious overdoses is much higher. So it really is looking at how we can walk a real middle path through um, supporting our, our patients for the best possible health outcomes and, and decreasing risk of harm. Thanks, Esther. Sounds like we're going to be talking a lot tonight about striking that balance in the order to achieve the best for our clients. So that's a good place to start from. We will be talking about the case in just a moment, but before we do that, there's a few uh, things just to cover off quite quickly. Uh, the ground rules, being respectful to other participants and panellists, as we would expect from uh, fellow professionals. There is the chat box, and please use that to chat with each other. Just try and keep it on topic so that uh, it doesn't distract people from what's being said in the main part of the webinar. Uh, you can change the slide and video layouts by clicking on the icon with the two arrows inside a circle in the top right corner. That makes the video larger and the slide smaller, whether you are interested in the people who are talking or what they're showing on the slide or whatever, to get a closer look, you can move those around. If you want to see slide only or video only, you click on the square icon with an upward and right direction arrow icon in the bottom right corner of the slide or video window. You'll figure that out as you go. Now, the webinar platform uh, is there on that next slide, uh, showing all there. Now, the learning outcomes, uh, let's talk about those because they're very important that people feel that we've addressed those tonight, which is certainly our intent. Uh, we want to discuss the difference between harm reduction and abstinence and how these approaches relate to mental health. We're going to outline how to work with people who are experiencing mental health challenges who are currently using or have used alcohol and other drugs in the past. We will be talking further about stigma and the importance of language and communication when providing care to people seeking assistance for AOD use. And finally, this is really the importance of the MHPN, I think, is to look for identifying strategies to engage specialist surgeons and other colleagues when supporting people who are experiencing mental health challenges due to their current or past use of alcohol or other drugs. Now, You've all seen the uh, case study. It is available under the information icon down there at the bottom there. It's the case of Mike, uh, who will be very familiar to many of you who have worked in this field for some time, and the issues he's had with alcohol and its effect on his behaviour and his relationships over many years, uh, and the point that he's come to now in his life where he's coming to request support from our panellists. And the first person who's going to talk about uh, Mike's case is Bill who you've already met, uh, who's an alcohol and other drugs mental health educator. So, Bill, over to you to take us through your presentation, please. Thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Um, after reading Mike's scenario and for the purpose of the uh, webinar, uh, I'm going to assume that Mike has already embraced the concept of abstinence uh, as it says that he's completed a detox and he's doing relapse prevention. Um, with that in mind, uh, I, would, I would strongly encourage Mike to have a full mental health assessment uh, just to... Um, uh, to have a, a, a thorough assessment and see if there is any other issues going on other than his um, his substance use disorder. I'd encourage him to attend weekly counselling appointments if he wishes for probably a three-month period. Uh, I'd say that'd be wise because he's going to... I, I would think he's going to need a lot of support in the next three to six months at least. Uh, I would explore and explain the potential benefits of a life skills program to Mike. Uh, from reading the seminar, it seems that Mike has spent uh, most of his last 20 years of life working and drinking and not doing much else. And uh, there's probably a, a strong likelihood that he's failed to develop uh, some of the skills in, in, in life skills areas such as emotional literacy, assertiveness, handling anxiety, goal setting, etc. cetera. Um, if possible, get him involved in something that's going to address those areas of his life, which will uh, no doubt impact on his longer term recovery, as well as exploring options to develop new social circles. From reading the seminar, it doesn't seem like he has any friends that uh, that don't drink in the manner that he used to. 
So I'm not suggesting he totally change his whole social circle. However, perhaps it could be useful to have at least a handful of friends that um, that don't drink, if that's what he's endeavouring to do. <clears throat> I'd explain to Mike the difference between a lapse and a relapse, um, which we can extrapolate further on that later, if need be. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I strongly encourage Mike to explore the option of attending weekly meetings of a community-based peer support network, at least in the initial stages of his recovery. Now, if it's harm in, it uh, could be a smart recovery group, or if he chooses to remain abstinence-based, uh, a 12-step uh, fellowship would probably be best for that. The reason I suggest this is because most of us would probably be working with uh, Mike for an hour a week or an hour a fortnight, perhaps, uh, that leaves a lot of time in between. He can um, access peer support in these uh, in the interim, in between our appointments, could be useful for him. I'd also uh, strongly encourage him to explore options for new uh, historical recreational pursuits, not associated with drinking. Could be uh, perhaps looking at his earlier life, um, early childhood, any. You know, looking at things from a strength-based perspective, was there any sports that he, he did have a strong interest in earlier on or, or hobbies before he um, commenced drinking at the, the rate that he, he, he um, currently is or was, I should say. Most importantly, I would explore any presenting and or potential obstacles or barriers to continued abstinence, if that's if abstinence is indeed his goal. So sitting down with Mike and saying, so where do you think this is going to be a problem? Mike, where, where are you going to come up against barriers or obstacles to achieving this abstinence that you want to achieve? Uh, and then help him develop strategies for each of the identified obstacles. So relapse prevention planning in short. Uh, next slide. Please. Okay. Um, moving on to this is uh, it could be you could <clears throat> take this on board when working with a client such as Mike, but also could be uh, some of this stuff is is gen general information uh, for when I'm working with someone who's struggling with AOD and or mental health issues. So I always encourage ownership and responsibility for their recovery and treatment outcomes. Um, I don't have a magic wand, much to many of my clients' dismay. Um, I can certainly point them in the right direction and uh, provide, uh, um, yeah, good direction and resources perhaps, but at the end of the day, they're going to own it and they're responsible for it. Uh, so plus many of our clients, as you may or may not know, struggle with a sense of, uh, feeling or have a perception that they're not in control, that everyone else, you know, they're at the, the whim and mercy of everyone else when that's not the case. So I encourage ownership and responsibility for their recovery. I'll explain the difference between abstinence versus harm minimisation or problematic substance use versus a substance use disorder and let the client choose which fits for them. Um, a thorough assessment of other life domains, for example, accommodation, relationships, employment, legal status, because well, the, all these areas are going to impact on their life and uh, and their ability to tackle their newfound recovery. Um, so support in those areas is going to flow on to support in their recovery from substance misuse. You always utilise a strength-based, recovery-focused approach and treat people as individuals, avoiding labels always. For instance, Jack is struggling with or in recovery from problematic alcohol or substance use as compared to an alcoholic or an addict. Alice is struggling with schizophrenia rather than Alice is a schizophrenic. Um, labels don't go, uh, more often than not, labels are not useful. So do not use the term or alcoholic uh, unless the client identifies themselves as one. 
You should maybe explore that if you wanted to. Next slide, please. Okay, so many clients or many of the clients that I see will not have a formal diagnosis of substance use disorder. Um, that, and it, it may or may not be helpful to uh, refer them to get one. Generally, clients attempting to make significant changes to the historical use of substances will experience some depression and, and or anxiety ongoing post-detox. So they'll definitely uh, experience that during detox, but it's not uncommon at all for people to experience it ongoing uh, for quite a long period. And for a variety of reasons, it can take three to five years to achieve sustainable emotional stability and recovery that may or may not be linked to the, the other life domains and the life skills that people have, um, have not developed over their, uh, the time that they've been using substances. So recovery really is um, a lifelong journey. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thanks so much, Bill. I must say I've got a list of questions I want to ask you after that, uh, which we'll come to in the um, in the in the discussion <laughs> later on. But just one quick question, maybe to ask about you said about maybe getting him to develop some social networks and friendships. How yes. do you? What sort of tips have you got about going about getting somebody like Mike um, uh, engaged with people? Well, I I, I would. Uh... Once, as, as I also said, explore historical things he's been involved in, hobbies, um, sports, perhaps, and um, and 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 explore whether he'd like to re-engage and maybe support him to do that. And and of course, not everyone. I mean, sporting clubs are known for a bit of substance use, but uh, not everyone is a problematic substance user at a sporting club. I'm sure he can find someone like-minded, but uh, the peer support networks are also a great uh, a great source of that. Um, but yeah. if it's something that he's already interested in, that does make a lot of sense. Yeah, Thanks and he's going to have a lot of time on his hands as well, Steve. Yeah. Uh, from the scenario, since he went to work and spent the rest of his time in his shed, yeah. Um, I think he's going to have to find something else to do besides hang around in his shed. Yeah, or maybe yeah. in a shed with other people. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Bill. That's been great. Um, now, Mike's going to find his way to a general practitioner, uh, as often the case, and Hester Wilson is uh, the general practitioner in this situation. So over to you, Hester, to take us through your presentation. Thank you, Steve. Next slide, please. These are the learning objectives repeated, so I'll get you to move on to the next slide. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the difference between harm reduction and abstinence. And certainly, as Bill has said, uh, the story um, for Mike is that um, he's, he's had a long history. So this is a man um, now age 43 with a strong family history of um, alcohol use disorder and a parent um, who started smoking and using cannabis at quite a young age, but didn't start drinking until his later teens. But in his late 20s, it really was starting to become an issue and, and caused, caused conflict in his relationship and he found it difficult to stop when it was clear that he needed to change his smoking and his drinking um, for the pregnancy. And it ended up in the relationship breaking up in the end and he tried cold turkey, tried AA, but without actually having a really good plan, he ended up actually having significant physical health issues in the form of a pancreatitis before he then went and did a medicated detox and is now engaged in relapse prevention. But for many people, and Mike may well be amongst them, though he may have taken on that, um, you know, that need to understand that need for him as an individual to be abstinent and perhaps for that abstinence to be lifelong. Many people don't want to stop drinking. They want to cut down their drinking. They want to do social drinking. They want it to actually be a part of their lives. It can be really difficult for people to get to a point where they say, I can actually see my life without alcohol long term. Uh, and some people will get to that point, but many people won't. And so it's working with people with where they're at. It can be hard as a practitioner because you can kind of see the amount of harm this substance is causing. It would be really good if you left it alone completely. But you've got to be, um, you know, working with someone with where they're at, is, as, as, as Bill said, really being aware of what their goals are. So not everybody wants to stop. And so looking at the things that you can do to help them re reduce harm. One of the things I'll say to people is every drink you don't have is doing you good. 
You know, so even if you cut down, that is going to have an impact. With other drug use, looking at, for example, um, needle syringe programs so that you can access clean um, injecting equipment, which means you don't then have issues in terms of bloodborne viruses. Um, looking at how you can do it in a less risky way. So safer injecting techniques or, you know, not, not drinking in, in hazardous situations. Overdose management, and this is an important one um, that we talked before about real-time prescription monitoring, but in terms of um, opioid use and opioid overdose, we now have Nixoid or Naloxone, which is a, um, an intranasal spray uh, available on the PBS. Um, and also available over the counter. So, and, and that is the EpiPen of opioid overdose. And we really need to be thinking about that. Which patients can we suggest this as an option? Other uh, issue is safe consumption rooms. And we have two in Australia at the moment, one in Melbourne and one in Sydney, that are places where people go to use drugs and are supported. There's lots of health interventions. We ensure they don't overdose. And there's very high rates of referral into treatment from those centres as well. So... For us, it's around being with where the person's at. It doesn't mean condoning risky behaviour. You know, it's very important to flag, I'm concerned. I'm concerned because of, of what you're doing. But understand that that person may not be at that point. And it's around helping them to build their sense of what they want and their skills, their confidence and the importance of change uh, in the way that they want to do it. Next slide, please. When we're thinking about mental health and drug and alcohol use and gambling as well, I would put in this um, as an aside, it can sometimes be difficult to work out what comes first. So is the mental health issue happening because of the drug use or is the drug use happening to actually manage the mental health issues or are they coexisting and it can be difficult to sort them out? It is important to have a think about that and to, to talk um, with the people you're seeing around how it might work for them and how it makes sense for them. There are a group of people who turn to substances to cope with life. Uh, and unless they build skills, and this is something that Bill talked about, it can be really difficult for them to change that or sustain that change because it has a really important part or a very important function in their lives. And one of the things I, I really want us to think about, and, and there's some debate here, is dependency or addiction or use disorders, substance use disorders, are they a mental health issue? And I think that that's an interesting question but certainly it is very clear that the, some of what happens as a result of these disorders are quite clearly physical illnesses um, and that some people who experience um, or use drugs and alcohol are very clear that they do not have a mental illness, that that's not how they see it. So once again, it's working with the person that you're seeing to help them understand how their substance use, and for Mike, in his case, it's the alcohol use, how that's impacted his life and building his skills to manage that better. Next slide. This is something Bill spoke about, um, and it is really clear that the experience of stigma causes harm. It leads to rejection. It leads to exclusion and discrimination. People do not access care, do not stay in care, do not have good outcomes from care, and it actually causes ill health in its very nature of being. Um, when we're thinking about language, there's some, a really great publication um, through NADA, which is called Language Matters. Um, and they talk around the, the things that sometimes we use and the better um, ones that we can use. For example, the idea of getting clean, you know, implies that you were dirty. Um, you know, and so we would think about, um, you know, abstinence or harm reduction or, you know, we're using less, less colourful words that are less stigmatising. As Bill said, talking about the person with a condition, they are not their condition. They're a unique, amazing individual that happens to have a particular condition. Um, really think about what if you call someone a doctor shopper or if they're abusing medications what, or, or, or substances, what does that say? And are there better words that you can use? Uh, and, I, you know, I always talk about um, substance use disorder being a chronic relapsing medical condition. This is real. This is serious. It is important and it needs treatment and it needs, needs support and it needs time and effort on the part of the person to help manage it. I'm really thinking about how you can help a person in terms of recovery, using language that helps them to think that there is hope for the future. Um, you know, and so the idea that somebody is resistant is it highly unhelpful. 
And so it may be that it's around, they're not at a point in their lives or they don't agree with the, with the treatment that you're suggesting. And so that gives you a space to actually have a conversation around how you can engage to help them to make change. Um, and and you'd be really aware that you may not mean to discriminate or stigmatise, but the language you use um, can make a difference to that. Also, that people that have experienced stigma are really, really open, really, really sensitive to it. And so you may not mean to, but you may stigmatise. And so just checking out and making sure. Sometimes people do take on the language. They will say, I am an addict. And I will always check out with them, what does that mean for you? Is that empowering? Or does that hold you in a place where you continue to use because there's a sense of hopelessness? And that was certainly something that Mike spoke about was the, the hopelessness and the shame of the situation that he had in and the power that that has to hold people in that place. Next slide. So once again, um, you know, the interesting thing in Mike's case was the GP and that said, I can't help you. And that's for me is just, it, it is an experience that people have. You know, I would say that for us as GPs, it is core to what we do to actually um, ask people about behaviours that they're undertaking that may cause them harm. Just like obesity, overweight, just like nutrition, just like smoking, alcohol, other drugs, gambling, gaming, those things that can cause harm. It is part of our role to ask about them. We may not have specific expertise in managing it, but I would flag that for many people, and if we're thinking about sort of risky or hazardous or problematic use, for example, of alcohol, that sometimes just having a conversation where you point to your concern for their health and well-being will help them to make a change. And I had an example of that with a guy today who was drinking 10 beers at Friday, Saturday nights and a couple of beers during the week. And he didn't want to change. That wasn't why he was seeing me. But I'd, I'd flagged with him just concerned about your health. You have diabetes, you have hypertension, you have hypercholesterolemia, you've got sleep apnea. I'm concerned about that level of drinking. It's, it's up to you what you choose to do, but it's harmful for your health. When I saw him again today, he'd cut down to three drinks on Friday and Saturday night and no drinks during the week. That was without me telling him to do that, just raising my concerns. And so that we'd have an important role in that as, as GPs, as health practitioners. Be aware of what's available in terms of referral options. Don't forget health pathways and um, also online options, um, which we're using more and more these days to support people, particularly if you're in rural, uh, regional, remote areas. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much indeed, Hesse. It's very clear. Um, I do fear that some of our colleagues do not go willingly into the support of people who are um, struggling with alcohol use and other drugs. I'm just not quite sure, you know, what it is that tips one GP to being very open to supporting patients in that situation and others who just say, I can't do this. Do you have any thoughts about that prickly one? Look, I think that... Um I think there sometimes is a bit of a moral judgment, so depending on the background that you come from. But it's also that sometimes we can feel like we don't have the skills, you know. So I can't ask this because I don't have the skills to respond. Um, and and you know, look, I, I would would say, you know, at the very least, we do need to be asking that question, and we do need to know where to refer someone, um, even if we're not confident with those skills ourselves. Whether it's to another colleague or whether it's um, to the specialist services, but, you know, it's a broad, broad church. GPs are a broad church. Church and we um, practice privately and so we do um, make a choice around what we do. I just say, you know, if at the very least, you know, do ask about um, all those things, all those behaviours that can affect people's health, whether it's drinking or alcohol or um, obesity or nutrition or whatever, because they do make a difference and know where to send someone if they're having issues. Sure. Thanks, Esther. And somebody in the chat room was just asking about the uh, language guy that you mentioned. Uh, I don't think we've got that in the um, resource list at the moment. What was that one? Um, that was the NADA Language Matters. Um, NADA, I can, right. NADA, yeah. I can um, search it up and, and put it in the chat so um, it can be sent through. That would be great. We think NADA might be Russian for nothing. I'm not sure. But anyway, there you go. Uh, fantastic. So thank you indeed for that. Now, from uh, GP to psychiatrist and um, moving on to Mary, uh, can you take us through your presentation, please? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so I just thought that I would look at um, the, the case story as uh, through the lens of the DSM-5 substance use disorder um, criteria because um, 
it is useful to have frameworks to help quantify things or make sense of things sometimes and also to help communicate with other people. So, I mean, I just really use it as an example of really how serious Mike's problem has been. So, essentially, there's there's four four um, categories of symptoms that are uh, included in the substance use disorder um, definitions in DSM. So, the first one is dependence. So, people might have cravings, um, tolerance and withdrawal symptoms if they don't have it. Um, the use, the level that they're using is risky. So, they might be um, having more of the substance than they intended to or continuing to use even when they know it's harmful. Um, it's causing social problems. So, the use continues despite the impacts on relationships, work and recreation and so on. And there's some impairment of control. So, people have tried to stop but been unable to. And it can be a serious medical problem. There's a lot of physiology involved in this, both acutely and chronically. It can be very serious. So, sometimes, you know, the diagnosis might be very important. And Bill raised that in his presentation about considering whether whether or not it might be helpful to refer someone on to, uh, you know, a health practitioner for that formal diagnosis. Next slide, please. I would have to say, having said all that, it is still possible to do that um, in a respectful, non-stigmatising way and using a strengths focus. Um, so just looking at Mike himself, so it's some evidence that he that he has met criteria. So he did try to quit ten years ago, um, and he, he couldn't stop. And now and then he was drinking even more to cope with his day and to stop feeling shaky in the mornings. When we meet him now, he's just undergone a medical detox after he became very unwell. Um, but the evidence of um, you know impacts on his health actually date back some decades. So he did have some. That should be low sperm count. Not slow sperm count, although they may have been slow, I don't know. Um, he was increasing his use. Um, his pancreatitis is a recent occurrence, and that's you know evidence of a really severe health problem. Um, the, uh, his use of alcohol had been impacting his relationships and his work. And as Bill pointed out, we you know he's been going to work and drinking in his shed, and we don't know anything else about what he does in his life for enjoyment or interest or um, other relationships. And he's always been a heavy user. So I wondered whether he might have a distorted perception of what normal drinking is. And I, unfortunately, I think that's the case for a lot of Australians because our culture does kind of normalise quite heavy drinking. He's always had big sessions and he's had years of being unable to stop it. So he will probably need some really – he's actually already decided on abstinence as Bill – pointed out early on. Next slide, please. So also specifically with this case study, um, there's possibly some genetic risk for him as his dad was a heavy drinker. And I wondered about um, the impacts of developmental trauma on Mike as well and whether he might be doing some chemical coping um, as uh, Hester mentioned in her presentation. That would be something I'd explore further with him. Um, and there have been multiple stressors for him. So he now has uh, physical health problems. He's got money problems. He's lost his marriage. He's going to have a lot of, um, well, he talks about having you know, guilt and shame around what's, what's happened. Um, and all of those things also elevate his mental health risks. So I'll be keeping that in mind. Um, and then I noticed in the story also the different responses of different health professionals and, and, it, and you know, the sort of pull your socks up response of the GP 10 years ago meant that he then went away and didn't seek help for a really long time, whereas when he's had a more empathic response, it's enabled him to keep participating in that health care. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to talk about – so I, I'm a generalist psychiatrist, I have to say. Hester knows way more about alcohol use disorder than I do as an addiction specialising um, generalist physician. Um, but I do work in a facility where we, we do have a lot of people with alcohol use disorder and I've done quite a bit of psychotherapy with them and I really like both of these models. Um, Bill talked with us at the beginning about um, helping Mike to find some things in his life other than drinking and I find both of these models are useful for that. So the first one is the PERMA, which comes from Seligman's research on wellbeing 
not only Seligman, a very big team of people over a couple of decades. But these five domains emerged from their work as what contributes to wellbeing. So I would ask Mike, and we might even have to look back in the past, what are the things you do that have given you or do give you positive emotions? We look for things like, you know, doing things in nature, doing things with other people, listening to music, um, whatever. Sometimes you have to prompt people. Engagement is what are the activities you do. It's so caught up in what you're doing, you don't don't, don't notice time passing. Um, Steve fleetingly mentioned doing something in the shed other than drinking or doing something in a shed with other people. So you can imagine if you was working on a project at a men's shed or something, that might be a source of engagement. Um, positive relationships, we've all talked about community, but does, it, does Mike actually have any relationships in his life now? What gives him a sense of meaning? And perhaps he hasn't really ever known that or has lost touch with that. And is there anything that he feels proud of? So sometimes even since he's chosen abstinence, sobriety, to give people a sense of accomplishment and then helping him to set small goals for things that he wants to um, achieve or has an improvement in his physical health or he gets back to work or he reconnects with an old friend. Um, this framework is very useful for mental health and um, substance use psychotherapy and it's all information. So if someone doesn't have anything under any of those headings, that's also really important and I actually incorporate this in a suicide risk assessment. So if he has nothing that gives him joy, if he doesn't have anything he gets absorbed in, has no relationships, no sense of meaning and never feels proud of himself, I'm going to be really worried about him. My other um, favourite model is the Healthy Mind Platter, which is from Dan Siegel and others. And it's not uh, when you look at it, it seems self-evident, but I really like having a framework. So I'd be checking in with him about, you know, what, what's, what sort of sleep pattern is healthy for him? What's he aiming for? How much physical activity does he need? How can he get that? What activities can he do where he's using his mind to focus? Connect, connections with others is really important. What does he do for fun? Does he do any activities where he can just play? And that's going to be a new thing for him if it's not involving drinking. Um, downtime. So sometimes we need to just have unallocated time where we can just sit and stare into space or out at the bush or up at the sky and let our mind wander. And then time in is learning to notice things like our sensations, the images that come to our mind, feelings and thoughts. Um, so I used that model again both in physical and in our substance use and in mental health care very often. Um, we're helping people who have both difficulties. So I really try and focus on the person rather than the diagnosis for the diagnostic group. And I think these models allow you to do that. Next slide, please. And um, I base this on Mike. So I've said that quitting is a marathon and Bill's pretty much already said the same thing. So again, I agree with everybody else that um, people need to make their own decision about harm reduction or abstinence and um, no matter what we think. Um, we can certainly, as particularly as doctors, I think you should give health advice as Hester gave the example that people choose. Um, now, it, sometimes medical assistance is necessary and it can often be helpful and can be both. So there are opportunities in prevention and early intervention. As Hester mentioned, just giving some health advice from your GP can help people you know, get that little bit of momentum for change. Um, uh, medically assisted withdrawal may be necessary for someone with a significant problem for safety reasons and also because it makes it um, more uh, achievable, more tolerable, and there's a lot of supports and it's also then an opportunity for relapse prevention. So somebody, I think, in the chat had raised a question about Camprel, a Camprosate, and um, that's certainly a medication um, which can um, help to reduce the risk of relapse. Hester might want to speak more about that. But essentially, um, medications we would use in the withdrawal process and then, then there's basically two or three which we use regularly in Australia to help with relapse prevention. They don't all suit everybody to have their pros and cons. Um, and I guess coming back to a theme is that connection with other people, a supportive network, a community, 
um, of peers, friends, family, whoever you've got left. Unfortunately, addiction can really uh, strain those connections. In my, from the chair that I sit in, working with people with substance use difficulties, connection seems to be the key. And doing a bit of family therapy with people, um, in a few cases where I've seen them, you know, coming back in time and time again, and then when we've done that family work, that's been the thing that's enabled them to make the changes that last. That's all from me at this moment. Thank you, Steve. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Mary, and thank you for touching on the uh, the campus eight question, which did come up uh, earlier. Um, let's now go to our discussion, and I might just follow on from that uh, because Mary's raised it. Hester, do you have any thoughts about uh, the use of medications at that point? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really important to know what you're treating. Um, if somebody has physiological dependence, so tolerance, needing greater amounts to get the same effect and withdrawal symptoms. So for alcohol uh, withdrawal, it can be quite dangerous depending on, on how high your level of dependency is. So people um, become shaky, they become anxious, they can't sleep. And if it's severe, they can actually have convulsions or de develop a delirium. That's much less common, but it's really important to get a bit of a sense of how severe that dependence, that physiological dependence is, um, because they need treatment for that. So for some people, if there's a bit of mild dependence, maybe they'll be able to manage those first few days of stopping drinking. Um, or people might need just a little bit of um, benzodiazepine if they've got a, a, a very mild, mild physiological withdrawal. If they've got substantial dependence, then they will need a very a structured program with potentially quite high doses of um, benzodiazepine. We usually use diazepam or oxazepam, but that would be in a controlled, supported <laughs> medical setting. So I do outpatient detoxes with people in their home, um, but that would be for people that are lower risk and I get them to go to pharmacy daily and pick up um, the diazepam and it goes for five days and it's decreasing dose. So it's very, very structured. One of the things that I see is people being given a script for 50 Valium to do that detox at home. That don't work. <laughs> I've never seen that work. So really getting that level of support and structure to help people do that and they need to stop drinking and take the um, benzodiazepine for, for, for the time that it is um, prescribed at most seven days, no more. Once they've done the withdrawal, then your relapse prevention medications have a role. And there are three that we use. Acamprosate is one, now Trexone is one, and Disulfan is the other. Acamprosate does have a place. Um, the issue is that it's three times a day. And so that can be a bit tricky. Some people love it because they love the regimented and taking the medication really helps them. Um, the other one is naltrexone, which is once daily, so it's a little simpler. The one flag with that is you can't take any opioids because it blocks all opioids. And the third one is disulfiram or antibuse, which does have a place and it does nothing until you drink and then it gives you a nasty disulfiram reaction, which people can end up in the emergency department. So it is, it does have risk and it's best used in someone where they've got good levels of support and they're followed up and it's really clear that disulfiram is the right option for them. There are a number of other medications that are sometimes used, but they're still experimental. So they do have a role, but to my mind, and both um, Bill and Mary have mentioned this connection, support, really working on how you want your life to be, your life goals, your values. Once, if you do have a dependence, once you've done that detox, those real shifts in how you live your life and the meaning that you have and the connection that you have are absolutely core cool to people maintaining change. Sure. Oh, thanks, Esther. That's great. Um, I, I'm actually going to use Chair's prerogative and go to poor old Pauline Enright in Hobart, who was complaining before about being cold. Her screen froze. It's that cold. So I think she's refreshed. Hopefully she's with us now. I think I mentioned it's 37 here in the Kimberley. Um, but Pauline's asked the question, at what point is normal, in inverted commas, or social drinking, in inverted commas, considered to be a problem? So where is the line between okay drinking and unhealthy or addiction drinking. So I think, uh, Mary, you were going to comment on that and Bill might have some thoughts as well. Yeah, look, I just wanted to say I think it depends who you ask. So, again, like what some sections of Australian culture think is normal drinking is very different from others. Um, 
I think it's always worth knowing the NH and MRC guidelines around um, safer drinking. Um, and then this is where I think the, sub, you know, the, the diagnostic criteria, for example, for substance use disorder can be really helpful because there's no, there, if someone meets those criteria, then it is a serious health problem, which there's no doubt in the mind of a doctor anyway that we, we need to give that strong advice that this is a serious health problem. Um, there is, as I understand it, there is an increasing um, body of evidence that there probably is no safe drinking level in terms of optimising your physical health. So even very modest levels of alcohol, like seven, you know, about 10 standard drinks per week, if that's chronically used, and that is within the safe drinking levels, probably doing things like increasing your baseline cortisol, as I understand it, which might be impacting your well-being overall. So it's probably not what all of us want to hear, um, but, but I think from a purely health stance, probably almost never having alcohol is ideal. I don't know whether Hester and um, whether we are, uh, others want to comment on that, but I'll leave it there. Oh, thanks, Mary. Bill, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I pretty much agree with Mary. Uh, I'd first of all start with the national healthy drinking standards um, and discuss, you know, the implications of, of uh, using alcohol at those levels. However, to most of Australia, those levels seem quite low. Um, and I don't, I think there's. <laughs> A very large percentage of Australians that drink in excess of the national healthy standards. Uh, and so, you know, there's that in-between period when, uh, when it starts to become evident, I guess, that there's a problem when their life, when they are developing health problems and they are losing relationships or losing jobs or licences, um, <clears throat> is clearly evidence that life is becoming unmanageable. It is impacting on different uh, domains in their life. Uh, however, as we all know, some people, in spite of all that, will continue uh, to drink. But, uh, yeah, look, uh, I personally don't drink at all and haven't for a very long time, but um, I would suggest that uh, certainly within the safe drinking standards, if at all. Sure. No, I think that's uh, really Steve, good advice. Steve, Sorry. I just remembered I just remembered the old the old general practice aphorism that you, you're drinking too much if you drink more than your doctor. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> That's uh, that's becoming a real problem with the current state of general practice at the moment, but we won't go down that pathway. No politics yeah. tonight. Steve, right. can I just, sorry, can I just flag um, yeah, yes, something sir. in addition to that? Totally agree with what everyone said, but also just flag that there are specific times during people's lives when it is even more dangerous. Pregnancy, breastfeeding, um, people that have got um, other health issues, particularly liver disease, and also as you get older, your body just does not cope with alcohol as well as it could. So an older person in their 70s, you know, even maybe in younger 80s, you know, that's having a few drinks, that that can actually cause significant harm. Um, and and I think, you know, there's a, there is a real shift kind of happening in our communities with Hello Sunday Morning and Sober Curious and those kinds of those kinds of movements. And, and young people are actually starting later in terms of drinking and are drinking less. So there are real shifts. And we have a larger proportion of people who are never drinkers um, in our community. So things are shifting. Actually, Hester, uh, Costas has asked us the question along those lines about um, observing some um, memory decline in uh, somebody who's... Uh, uh, around about 70 and whether that could be alcohol related rather than being a, a dementing process? How do you well, tease those apart as a GP? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that certainly alcohol can cause um, dementia in itself. Um, but even in someone who's not drinking at you know, massive levels, that alcohol can actually affect memory. And one of the great ways to actually work that out is to actually to get someone to stop and see how their memory goes. Their sleep will improve, their mood will improve, and their memory will improve. Right. Thanks for that. Now, there's been another really important foundational question asked by Lynette, who's asked about um, 
uh, harm minimization versus total abstinence. And in our case today, uh, the choice has been made for total abstinence. But she's wondering if the team can think of any um, indicators uh, which might mean that somebody's more likely to be successful with a harm minimization approach versus a total abstinence approach? Um, or is it really just their personal choice that we have to rely on? I'd say, if I might, that uh, it's largely hypothetical until they're off it for six months in, uh, well, or or are, are successful in um, uh, quite a large reduction in their use. You know, if someone can go from drinking copious amounts of alcohol that's causing them harm to having two a week, well, it's wonderful. Mm. That's, that's great. Um, however, yeah, sometimes that's not the case and it takes a bit of practice and, um, you know, I think it's a time uh, it's a time thing. Most people will try and um, and and the controlled um, harm inversion and 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 good luck to them. And if they're successful, that's fantastic. If they're not, well, then they might decide. It's 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 really up to the the client, patient, or whatever consumer at the end of the day, anyway, because you can't tell anyone or make anyone do anything. It's when they decide that they can uh, they can manage harm in or or they need to abstain. Um, yeah. Thanks, Bill. I hope that's useful. It is. Any other thoughts from the panel on that one? I, I mean, I, 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 Hess probably knows if there's, you know, research studies on this, but I, just from my observation, I think that there are some people who really didn't have a problem with any substances and have sort of been had it you know, secure attachment and no particular mental health problems and um, have had a series of stressors in their 40s or something like that and then fallen into heavy alcohol use. Um, to me, that that does feel different than someone that's kind of struggled with it, you know, for 20 years from their teenage years. Um, and also I look at other types of um, addictive behaviours as well. Um but I don't. I th I totally agree with Bill. I think that in the end, it's it's a it's a try it and see, and the person needs to be in charge of the choice. Sure. But he Hester's probably got some other. Yeah, look, look, certainly, um, you know, people do want to have choice. What I find, though, is if somebody has a significant dependency, a significant alcohol use disorder, like Mike they quite often will want to go for controlled drinking and they need to go on that journey and I go on that journey with them, but they get to a point where they go, oh, you know what, Hester, I just can't do this controlled drinking. I need to stop completely, you know, and, and I, I will say, yeah, yeah, look, I'm a little concerned that you might not be able to manage the controlled drinking, but have a go. Let's, let's have a go. Let's do it. Let's see how it goes. Let's support you through this. And and then they'll get to that point. So it's helping. It's 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 helping them by su by supporting. They have a go, and sometimes they can manage it. And somebody that's got a little bit of dependence, they quite often can shift back to controlled drinking. And Mary, those people that have you know very secure attachment, have done very well, but have had some some hiccups in their lives and have started drinking heavily, they generally can switch back pretty easily because they've got that history. Um, but you know, absolutely, you know, supporting that person, understanding that this is a significant issue. Issue. Um, and they, they will need support and it's not just a one time it's ongoing thanks Esther and I must say that a question has jumped off the list of me from Holly uh, who's asked about the challenges of dual diagnosis um, working with somebody who might have perhaps a psychotic disorder um, who's using uh, methamphetamine um, and somebody else mentioned maybe having uh, a bloodborne virus and also a substance abuse disorder. Uh, I gather we're sort of multiplying complexities if we're working with people who have other significant um, diagnoses in their lives. Any thoughts about that? Well, I, I mean, I, this is the normal, the normal patient for me. And I actually think for a lot of general practitioners as well, you know, complexity is actually a very large part of what we see. And I think I would, I, I always think about a formulation. 
it's not just about a list of diagnoses. It's about the whole picture of what's going on. What's the context? Who is this person? What is their life story? Um, you know, you know the old biopsychosocial. Think about occupational, spiritual, and cultural. What's happening in the family, um, and and then think about it in a complex way. And I think that complex problems often have complex solutions. So there are often multiple different things that could help. And I think in the end, the things that are going to be the most helpful are the ones that the person themselves chooses. With having said that, obviously there are sometimes medical priorities. So if someone is hugely at risk of causing themselves alcohol-related dementia or um you know, they've just had pancreatitis or um, they have liver failure, you know, those those things are a kind of obvious priority. But in terms of dual diagnosis, I think about the, the person rather than a list of diagnoses. I don't know if that that's how I see it anyway. No, okay. Thanks for that. There are so many rich questions coming in. I just don't quite know where to start, but there's one that uh, – has been given to us by Helen Baker, who's asked about um, gender differences in this area and is reflecting on um, uh, an observation uh, that middle-aged women who have never or rarely or very minimally uh, been drinkers appear to, in some cases, suddenly begin drinking heavily and can progress quite rapidly along that path. I don't know if the panel has observed that. Is any any research evidence to support that observation? Yeah, there's some really good research on the gender differences, particularly with alcohol. Uh, and what we know with women is that they tend to telescope, as, as that person said, that they, they develop the issue and develop harm very, very quickly. It escalates much more quickly. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a different kind of dynamic that happens for women. And there's a whole piece around being carers, being mothers, um, being good, being good parent that is very different for women. And the services that we have in place quite often don't actually support women in, in ways that they need to be supported. So it is, it's an area that we really haven't, I think, done very well in Australia in lots of ways. And, and look, men are more likely to have um, a substance use disorder than women. But when women have one, they really do suffer and they suffer early. And they may present in quite different ways. So they're more likely to present with mental health issues. Um, and we need to actually ask them about their substance use and really look at it um, uh, from ad addressing um, the, the, the parenting issues, but also connection and affiliation are really important in terms of treatment. The other thing is we are seeing this in middle-aged ladies, my age, um, that went from not drinking very much to suddenly drinking. And it might not be they're not do doing the, you know, the 20 schooners, but they're drinking a couple of bottles of wine, you know, so that's 14 standard drinks all of a sudden. And COVID really unearthed a lot of this of people working from home, starting to drink earlier, getting stressed. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, um, and and suddenly this this group of never drinkers or, or in, you know social drinkers whatever that means you know, who are drinking very small amounts are now actually experiencing quite a lot of harm. All right. Well, thanks for that, Bill. Any thoughts from you on that? Um, <clears throat> look, I would uh, probably approach it the same way as everyone else. What all I can really say is that. I have witnessed it uh, in middle-aged women and and it does seem to escalate very quickly like someone at 40 years of age who's, you know, uh, may have maintained a house and a family and children and everything all of a sudden at 40, 45 uh, begins to drink and within five years, they're very, you know, they're drinking lots and lots and it's impacting on their life in uh, numerous ways yeah. uh, detrimentally. And do you have a different toolkit that you bring out when working with a, a, a woman compared to a man? Um, no. No? Same principles? Same principle. Uh, you know, deal with the person um, and explore the background Obviously, a 44-year-old woman who has uh, just started or you know, hasn't been drinking long, I'm going to explore the historical 
um, life prior to uh, before the drinking escalated? What happened just prior to that? Was it a divorce? Was it uh, some other thing that happened? Uh, whenever I see uh, an escalation in use, I always want to know what happened just prior to that and explore that. It may or may not have anything to do with it, but, uh, yeah, Thanks, right. Stuart. Thanks for that. Yep. Yep. So there have been a number of questions asking about the origins of this use of alcohol. Some people asking if there's a genetic basis that's been proved. Some people asking if there's an addictive personality type that can be recognised and documented. I was wondering if the panel has any thoughts about that. Can we categorise people on the basis of having a genetic or physiological or a personality that leads them more into this sort of hazard? Look, it's it's certainly very clear that if you have a family history of substance use disorder, um, that that increases your risk. Is it familial? Is it genetic? Uh, is it modelling? Is it that, that that's the household that you're brought up in and that's how you have seen your parents um, manage um, their lives through the use of substances? It's, it's likely that there is a, a genetic predisposition, but not everybody that has um, someone in their family who has problems with substances will have that. So it's certainly an important uh, risk factor, um, but it's much more complex than that. Addictive personality, I don't know, Mary, that seems um, not something that I would go for. <laughs> I'll leave that to you as the psychiatrist. You know much. Oh, more look, I'm that. not. I'm not an expert on this either. But I, I mean, I think sometimes people find it helpful to identify that. So there are some people that say I recognise my propensity to addictive behaviours, and so therefore I'm really careful around that. I'm not going to gamble. I'm you know watchful of anything that gets out of you know out of balance. Um, but it's it's not terminology that I use and I guess in the context of stigma um, I think it's always complex is the answer and um, listening to the whole story you know as all of us have said that that we would try to do to, to try and think about this this person and why are they presenting at this time with this particular problem or these problems there's often many things going on and I was taken in Bill's presentation by the mention of a lapse versus a relapse. I was wondering, Bill, can you explain that to us and see if the other panellists have any comment on how we tell people about their lapse versus relapse? Well, so just that um, a lapse is, is like a one-off um, return, say, if you were trying to remain abstinent from alcohol and, and perhaps one evening you uh, slipped um, and had two or three perhaps, and then the next day was uh, may be remorseful about it and wish that they hadn't, that uh, whereas a relapse would be a return to full-scale behaviour prior to their attempts at abstinence. Um, well, I think it's very, and it's very important, uh, it can often be important, um, to sometimes normalise the fact that people do have, can have lapses, particularly early in, in recovery if they're trying to remain abstinent, and that uh, it's not a shameful thing and that uh, the most important thing about a lapse is to identify what happened just prior to it uh, so that when it happens again, you can react differently. Um uh, however, there, there, there can be a tendency for some people if they do have a lapse to say, oh, we'll bugger it, I'll bugger it up now and, and, and head straight back into, you know, their uh, historical behaviour, which is not useful. Mm. Um, and as far as the genetic tendency and all the rest of that, I'd say it's a very, very complex uh, area and I don't think... Uh, I don't think anyone will say that they know exactly, um, you know, that's why we've got a biopsychosocial model. Um, and, yes, and, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's up to the person to, 
to identify. Uh, look, sometimes it can be useful um, to uh, help people put things in a container, but I quite often, uh, in managing a, a park environment, which is a you know, prevention and recovery care, we would have lots of uh, clients that yeah, possibly could have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and we wouldn't. We would say they had emerging borderline traits um, because uh, sometimes it's not useful to um, to have a label, particularly with young people, because they can take on that label and make it themselves when it's not necessarily um, the case. Um, Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. I see that Thanks, with all the talk there's been about labels tonight that uh, Hester's uh, posting a link to a paper she's written on that, which is open access. So um, our participants will be able to have a look at that for a bit more detail as well. And Hester, one thing you said that maybe pricked my ears up was about people sleeping better once they stop drinking. The question's been asked by Sue about uh, clients who say, but alcohol helps me sleep, nothing else helps me sleep. Do you have a response to that? So like any psychoactive substance that is a sedative, you do sleep, but it's not normal sleep. So there is a natural healthy architecture for sleep. And, and certainly, yes, when people stop using a substance, they may have some insomnia for a period of time. The question is, is that actually a, an insomnia condition of itself? Is it related to their anxiety and their, their depression, their other mental health issues? Because what we do find, and it can take some time, and this was something Bill pointed to, is that um, once the alcohol as a sedative is out of the system, you actually um, move back to your your normal sleep architecture and the quality of your sleep actually improves. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty good response. So hopefully that'll, that'll help you out with that one. We're at the point in the uh, webcast now where we need to go around the group and ask each of our presenters just for a last comment. And I'm particularly interested in how people go about uh, collaborating with other professionals. So, Bill, we should start with you because you started us off. What does collaboration look like in your daily work? Who do you collaborate with in the course of a day? Well, in the role of education, it's mainly with industry, um, in, in, in engaging with various, various industry uh, practitioners, organisations, but uh, as, a, as a practitioner myself, it's, uh, it's fairly important to liaise with other organisations the person might currently be working with. So if, if they're coming to you for addiction and they're seeing a mental health professional, um, despite our best attempts at integrated mental health and uh, addiction treatment, quite often it still seems to be a bit of a silo. And so it really does make sense to uh, liaise with the other practitioners so that we're all on the same page. Absolutely. And Hester, what about your daily work? Who Who's on your speed dial? Oh, everyone. Uh, look, it really depends on the individual. But the thing that I would say is we need a treatment team for you. And that includes your counsellor, your GP, your mental health, you know, if you're seeing a psychiatrist or an addiction specialist, your family or carers or the important connections. It may well be, you know, your workmates. It depends on the situation. But it's really understanding that uh, it's, it takes more than one health professional. Um, particularly if someone has a significant use disorder, um, that they're going to need they're going to need lots of support, and it's going to be ongoing. So it really is helping them to gather that team of people around them that, to support them in their journey towards recovery. Right now, I'm a little bit nervous to look at the chat box to see whether people are saying that there are such services in their area, particularly in rural areas. It's very difficult, of course, when health professionals are in such sort of supply in certain places, but um, uh, obviously the team is ideal. And one thing MHPN can do is to connect people with other professionals in their area. So you make best use of what services you have. That's absolutely true. All right. So thank you for that, Hester. Uh, Mary, final comments from you. 
Well, I just wanted to tell a little story. Um, we had this meeting to prepare for tonight with all of us and Bill talked about the difference between laps and relapse at that. And I learned from Bill. And so yesterday when a patient came in and she, I hadn't seen her for a month and she said um, that she had a relapse and then she pulled herself up and she said, no, a lapse. I had one bottle of wine and then I haven't done it again since. And I was able to say, I noticed that you just said lapse instead of relapse. Can you tell me more about that? And then we were able to kind of celebrate the fact that she pulled it up. And I just, so my answer about collaboration is that I look for opportunities to learn from everybody. And um, I, you know, I really love using exercise physiologists. I value OTs, social workers, psychologists, mental health nurses, my psychiatric colleagues. I get a lot of second opinions, working with general practitioners, drug and alcohol counsellors, and I'm always encouraging um, clients to have their own peer support communities. I think that community is so important. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Mary. Uh, it's been a fabulous night. For me, the, the, the big thing has been about terminology and that it can be damaging it can be incredibly empowering as well for somebody to be able to use even that simple concept of lapse versus relapse and to use that distinction as a way of giving themselves courage to run this marathon so that's been really really valuable thank you all so much um i'll just finish off please don't leave everybody who's online uh because there's a few things we do need to talk about at this stage um the uh you might have noticed it's got dark up here and I'm having trouble seeing my screen clicking into the light. Um, so please do make sure that you do the exit survey and provide us with some feedback. There's the pie chart icon in the lower right corner of the screen next to the famous speech bubble. So please fill out the survey or a message will pop up on your screen when the webcast ends. Um, so please let us know. You also will receive communication from MHPN, MHPN with a link to the recording when it's... Um, when it's been processed. So you can share that with colleagues if you wanted to um, talk through what we've talked about tonight. Now, the next webinar is Navigating the Mental Health Challenges When Living with a Physical Disability. That's on the 17th of October. And also on October the 19th, uh, there's Breaking the Silence in the Black Rainbow Queer Robbery series. What a fantastic word that is. Uh, so the Black Label Queer Robbery series on the 19th of October at one o'clock, Breaking the Silence. Then we have It's Never Too Late to Diagnose ADHD, uh, 7th of November, and then Emerging Minds to support, Supporting Social and Emotional Wellbeing of Children with Higher Weight on the 17th of November. The uh, Primary Healthcare Network series says non-medical supports and programs for older Australians on the 6th of December. So please keep an eye out for notifications when you can register for these webinars or look for upcoming webinars on the page on the MHPN website. Uh, also, there's a podcast out today uh, in conversation with, and that's with Mary O'Hagan and the amazing Dr. Ruth Vine, who's our chief psychiatrist and an excellent human. So that's part four, and that's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the website itself. Um, so the final comments are in the last minute that the uh, MHPN networking program does support practitioners to meet and network with others from around their local community. There are 350 groups across the country and around 30 have a focus on perinatal and women's mental health. Um, they're listed on the slide and MHPN will send you more details about these in the post webinar email. <clears throat> if there isn't a network in your area, why not set one up? So you can do that by getting in touch with NMHPN through their email address, networks at nmhpn.org.au, um, or pop it in the feedback survey, which we're all about to fill out now. So before I close, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you, everyone, on the panel for tonight and also for the participants for taking part. I now have a locally called Barramundi to go and talk to about being pan seared. So thank you all so much. Wish you all the best for the evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.